there would be no fish in the ocean. And uh, and I think so now that we are on recording, I just want to let you know today's uh, talk is about counting the water so that we can find where the energy is in the water and actually make the case for water investments. Delighted to have Gary Klein and Associates Incorporated with us, along with uh, four strategy consultants who have uh, implemented some amazing solutions, which you'll hear, hear about shortly. Our talk will be about 25 minutes, but then we'll go into a Q&A. And we invite your questions in the chat box. And we also hope you will mark your calendars for our next event on September 20th, when we will discuss the waterpreneur's dilemma, the very challenge with getting uh, technology implemented today. And we'll have experts who will talk about standards as well as new models and uh, and the case studies and examples that are essential for water to work. Many of you have already encountered Global Water Works. I just want you to know we are a 501c6 organization, a trade association designed to accelerate adoption of smart water technologies by showcasing the examples and the experts and making them accessible to you. We hope you will chime in with our LinkedIn group also, to which you will receive a link after this webinar, and I think you already did with a reminder. But I am just really excited to have both a stellar crew who will be presenting today, as well as uh, an amazing roster of participants who are very well informed and have a lot to add on what is possible in terms of water efficiency and uh, sustainable and cost-effective solutions. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Gary Klein and Robert Fortunato, who have teamed up to demonstrate how assessing energy and water systems holistically can save costs and increase efficiencies. Both are internationally known and have been intimately involved in sustainable initiatives in California and around the globe. Gary is president of Gary Klein and Associates Incorporated and has been intimately involved in um, renewable energy since 1974. Uh, one fifth of his career, in interestingly, was spent in uh, the kingdom of Lesotho, uh, the rest in the United States. He's served 19 years with the California Energy Commission and he has provided consulting on sustainability since 2008. He received his BA from Cornell University in 1975 with an independent major in technology and society and an emphasis on energy conservation and renewable energy. And I don't know if anyone else has observed this, but Cornell seems to be the water hub of attracting and educating and releasing folks like the Think Water Group, Seth Siegel's uh, Let There Be Water, many other experts in water. And uh, Robert Fortunato, um, I was pleased that Gary introduced me to. Both of them helped with our Israel-California Water Conference. And uh, Robert is president of Four Strategy Consulting, a leadership and strategy consultant to some of the largest and most successful firms in the world. His work focuses on helping firms exceed their profitability, gain competitive advantage, and organizational effectiveness. He uh, holds a degree from Wharton and has continued education classes at Harvard, UCLA, and a special program with a professor at MIT. So he understands both the engineering side and the business side. And uh, uh, Robert tapped Gary's expertise to fulfill his vision for a zero net energy, zero carbon green idea house, which you will hear about shortly. I, um, it has totally inspired me. And uh, I've asked Gary to review the water energy nexus to help us find the savings as both he and Robert did with the green idea house. So Gary, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Um, so if we were in a room together, I would ask you quite quickly, and directly, what's missing in this picture? It's intended to discuss the water energy nexus, but I will observe that there are several things that might be water and energy related that are not in here. For example, agriculture. For example, uh, recycling. For example, trees don't seem to be here either. Um, it's really interesting to me to see visions of the water energy nexus to see what's included and what's not. And in our discussions today, we will be discussing uh, primarily the urban water use cycle, not the ag water use cycle or the environmental water use cycle. Um, so I want to make it clear that we're not going to discuss everything, but we should be prepared to understand and look at it all holistically at some stage. 
Yeah, and that's a very interesting, Gary, because typically people do think of agriculture as the main water uh, consumer, but but you're right, this is about energy in water. So uh, tell us about what California looks like there. Well, um, so in California, as in much of the U.S., um, the bulk of the water used by humans goes to agriculture. In California, there are uh, three defined types of water, if you will. There's environmental water, um, there's ag water, and there's urban water. And the ratio of um, ur ag to urban is 80% to 20%, and that number might be fairly similar in much of the U.S. where there's significant agriculture, um, at least from some experiential data that that would be true. In California, I like to ask people if they know anyone who lives in San Diego. I suspect many on the phone do. Um, and the question there is, where does their water come from? Well, it comes from as far away as, uh, well, Colorado, for one. Um, and the other direction, north, it's coming from uh, Oregon. It turns out the Klamath River goes down through California, and there's a bypass up north there where the cursor's moving, um, basically in that area that connects into the Sacramento River system and ends up all the way coming down the Central Valley uh, through the state and federal water projects up over the Tehachapi Mountains and then down the Orange Line into San Diego. Um, What's interesting in California, people think of California as extremes for the water energy connection, and it is true we have them, but we also have very small numbers as well. Um, so we lift water over the Tehachapi Mountains, yeah, and it's, it's got a, a fairly high energy intensity, which we'll come to in a minute, um, but there's also three main areas in the country, in the state, that have gravity-fed water systems. San Francisco uh, and the West Bay, Oakland and the East Bay, and a small community called Los Angeles um, all have little green lines that, if you look on the map, run downhill as gravity-fed projects into their communities. Um, so the average energy intensity of water in California uh, is much like, I believe, much like the rest of the nation. It has got extremes that many places don't. So let's look at the water use cycle energy intensities. First, the boundary conditions, everything within the blue dash lines um, is what we're going to discuss. And it's the urban water use cycle boundary, if you will. Um, you'll notice that the range of kilowatt hours per thousand gallons can be a factor of 10 difference, 3 to 32, 3 to 35, pick your number, it doesn't matter exactly. Um, and that's inclusive of all of the energy in the boundary. Um, so we start with the source of water, then we have supply and conveyance, water treatment and water distribution. Um, you end up at the various end uses, and then some water uh, gets waste, collect, wastewater gets collected, treated, and discharged, and in some communities we recycle water. Um, so this graphic is intended to show those relationships. So the questions then come as to where does the energy intensity numbers come from. Uh, if we could go back, Mary, one more time, please. Um, the supply and conveyance varies from 0 to 16 kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. Uh, 0 is gravity-fed water. 16 is lifting it up over the Hatchapi Mountains. Water treatment, um, I have 0.1 to 16. 16 is new ocean desal. But the range for California, we have old ocean desalinization, and it's 32 kilowatt hours per thousand gallons. Um, so the numbers can vary quite a bit. Uh, most communities have ups and downs, and every, very little runs all the way downhill from this top to the bottom. So on average, communities look pretty similar. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Water-related energy use in California, this is from 2001. Uh, the reason I'm using 2001 uh, is that uh, that's the report I was staff lead for, and so I know the numbers and I'm comfortable with them. These numbers vary annually. Why? Well, rainfall varies annually, and the amount of water supplied to the farm uh, versus on-farm pumping changes annually, and that just makes the numbers, the energy numbers vary accordingly. 
So we're looking at the groupings of this, um, and you see water supply and wastewater treatment under the urban water use cycle. They combined uh, add up to be a little over 9,000 gigawatt hours a year. Uh, the ag side of things is a little over 10,000 gigawatt hours a year, and res commercial and industrial are as shown. The therms in California, um, most of our water heating energy, the vast majority, probably 85% or so, uh, is provided by natural gas, and virtually all of these numbers here are about natural gas for heating. There's a little bit for pumping. Diesel, turns out it was hard to get the exact numbers when we did the report, but the totals are pretty small. That goes to the water supply. Most of the diesel that's used in water uh, water related energy use um, is going to be on farm pumping, at least the way we were accounting it. Um, and many of you have probably heard the statistics 19% of California's electricity goes to water in some way, 30 something percent goes to natural gas, and a bunch of diesel. Once you know the energy, you can count the metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Yeah, interesting. And I know your focus is on hot water, uh, Gary. So um, could you just tell us about that? Obviously, that carries the most energy. Yeah, so basically we have this range of indoor cold water intensities, and the typical number nationally is about 5 kilowatt hours per 1,000 gallons. Uh, and the energy intensity of hot water is about 50 times more energy intensive than cold water. Um, certainly for typical equipment, it's about 50 times more. And if you're going to pick a problem to work on, I believe in picking big problems, and hot water is a big problem in the scheme of the water energy connection. That's why I work on it. Mm -hmm. And I know you're working on two amazing examples, which uh, we're fortunate to have one of your clients, Robert Fortunato, to tell us about uh, the work that the two of you have done on the zero net energy, zero carbon green idea house. So, Robert, in your hands. Uh, thanks, Mary, and thanks, Gary, for the introduction. Uh, and welcome to all of you uh, to the case study of the green idea house. Um, Obviously, I just have a couple of minutes today to talk about it, so I would like to point you to uh, the TEDx that we did that explains the backstory, uh, sort of the how and the why uh, in a little bit more detail. O only 18 minutes, but it was uh, basically a five-year program or process uh, to get through. And if you just put in my name and TEDx into, into your search engine, you'll find it immediately. So I, I don't want to repeat everything there. But essentially, we had the objective to figure out, can we build a net zero energy and zero carbon case study uh, that is a house that harvests as much energy as it uses on an annualized basis and do it with zero combustion so there's no pollution um, and we actually cu cut off the gas line and you know to give you the end of the story first uh, the pr project was built with standard construction materials off the shelf technologies actually costs less than standard construction and delivers to us in excess of 2.5 megawatt hours a year, and that includes our uh, char fully charging our electric car as well. So we've managed to do something uh, that had not been done previously in terms of uh, off-the-shelf technology, standard construction, and actually costing less. And really did that with with Gary's help. Um, you know, we were able to look at things from a holistic model and uh, really understand how we could cut material costs, cut uh, the amount of waste we used, the, the amount of water, the amount of energy, and the amount of toxicity. And uh, I'm trained as a, as a business person. Uh, I have an, you know, an economics degree. And so in my mind, it just made sense that if you reduced all those things, you would actually come up with a solution that worked better and actually cost less. And uh, Gary and I worked together. I first uh, got passionate about this, and I took one of Gary's classes. And it was clear to me that he understood something that other people didn't understand in the space. And as he mentioned, uh, the hot water usage specifically was one of the things that was a giant hurdle to getting this done. And so we did it uh, much more holistically and less expensively uh, than standard construction uh, that you'll see in, in a moment. Um, so. Um, as you can see in, in each one of the bullet points, we had an, a very specific way to come 
come at efficiency that wasn't radical and it wasn't you know um, crazy expensive. Uh, these are small things that you can do uh, that radically improve uh, the uh, efficiency of a building. Um, and Mary, if you could advance to the next slide, I'll, I can describe what it is that we did specifically in terms of hot water. Uh, the heating system was extraordinarily simple. Uh, in researching these projects, we went to you know dozens and dozens of quote unquote key study houses that were attempting to do this thing. And we always ended up in a room that looked like the boiler room of a submarine. And uh, nobody, nobody wants to buy that and nobody wants to maintain that. And so we were really shooting for simplicity here. And that's what you're seeing on the right hand side. Uh, there is, this whole thing works on three very simple tanks. Um, the first tank brings in water into our garage. Uh, at, in the wintertime at 55 degrees, uh, puts it into an old recycled hot water tank. Uh, that's actually the old hot water tank that was in the house that was gas fired. We repurposed it. Uh, we stripped off the insulation. My son and I stripped off the insulation in the jacket. And so it sits in the garage, which is nominally 70 degrees. So it turns that 55 degree water into 70 degree water uh, for free, actually. So it's a, sort of a preheater that then goes into what is uh, a heat pump hot water heater. And the heat pump hot water heater is three times more efficient than what it, everybody's installing these days, which is tankless hot water heaters, which are nominally 93 or 95% efficient. This thing is 238% efficient. So it's taking that 70 degree water, bringing it up to 130 degree water uh, with an incredible level of efficiency and actually less expensive. Um, and we looked at it holistically. We said we don't want to run out of hot water uh, because the recovery rate on this unit is not, not nearly as much as a gas unit. But with the unit, you see Gary next to what is called a power pipe, uh, which actually recirculates the drain water around uh, a copper pipe. And then uh, that cold water is nominally heated up to go back to the shower, uh, shower spigot. Uh, and so you don't need as much hot water at the spigot as a result of that power pipe. And I'm sure Gary can explain that with more detail and precision. But essentially what we ended up with was a system that required less hot water and, uh, and was less expensive, especially when you consider that most hot water, uh, tankless hot water heaters need a one inch main from the street. Uh, so to redig the main would have, uh, for us, cost an additional $6,000. So the tank to the left of that tank is identical, and it actually operates. It is the boiler for our hot water system, which is our heating system. And so the distri distribution is essentially the same. It's a radi baseboard radiator system with manifolds. But instead of buying a $5,000 um, boiler, we spent $1,000 on another tank, which, uh, which heats the hot water uh, for our baseboard um, system and again radically less expensive and three times more efficient with zero pollution and the last thing I want to mention uh, we're in, we happen to be in California and so to eliminate the gas line into the house means that we've completely eliminated the uh, potential for carbon monoxide poisoning and a, an explosion in the event of an earthquake so we not only have a, a so solution that's much more efficient uh, less polluting but it's actually safer uh, for the occupants at the same time. Uh, and this is our personal residence. So we have a personal stake in these things. And uh, I take personal pride in the fact that if, in fact, there's an earthquake, uh, my family is going to be safe. And, and our house could be a haven uh, for the neighborhood as a result of the way we collect and store uh, water and energy specifically. Um, so again, I want to keep my comments brief. Uh, but thanks for the opportunity to be with everybody today. Yeah, Robert, that's excellent. Uh, and Gary, could you just comment on uh, the 30% water savings was through the reuse and what? how did you guide on the water savings? The What we did on the water savings was to look at the, the ideas as a system, as Robert pointed out. Um, first, we, we, we designed the plumbing to be inherently more efficient in the delivery of the hot water. Um, and that reduces the waste per hot water event from about a gallon to about two cups. Um, that's a significant reduction, and it happens every time you want hot water. 
Um, we capture waste heat from water running down the shower drains. There's actually two different systems, one this vertical one and another a horizontal one in a different part of the house. So for each shower, we're reducing the amount of water, hot water that's needed um, and therefore the amount of hot water energy that's needed to make up the difference. Um, Robert picked water efficient um, shower heads, faucets, and appliances, um, but we're not telling people to take shorter showers. They can do what they need to do appropriately. Um, and looking at it all as a package in the right order, starting with the infrastructure and ending with the faucets and appliances, enables us to capture the vast majority of the available savings without wow. addressing, without affecting behavior in a negative way. Yeah, which brings us to your next uh, project that you're working on, which we shared a case study on uh, the shower of the future, if you could describe the similar Absolutely. technologies. Um, I suspect several of us on the phone remember when shower heads were five gallons a minute um, and you got blasted out of the shower every time you took it, and that's not what we have in the U.S. anymore. Um, the legal rate of flow for a shower head is now limited to 2.5 gallons per minute um, and most of those shower heads operate closer to 2 GPM based on city water pressures and how the faucet the shower heads actually work. So what if you could have a shower that didn't matter exactly how much flow rate there was, let's imagine it's 4 gallons a minute and you could take a shower for eight or ten minutes, and less than 20% of the typical amount of water would run down the drain. That would be very interesting from um, sort of our personal biases of I'd like a, a, a more luxurious shower perhaps. Um, and the idea here is out of Sweden. Um, it was developed um, in part for, it was developed, the ideas were developed for a NASA mission to Mars. They had to figure out how people could bathe and stay clean and they could only have a certain amount of water so all of it would have to be recycled. And in order to make sure that the folks in the, the spaceship don't, you know, don't die, they have to clean, treat, and otherwise make the water safe before it's reused. Um, and then the system reheats it before reuse. So it starts out with warm water coming from your water heater. Um, it goes into the shower system, the pan collects it, treats it, cleans it, and then reheats it before reuse. It's a very clever idea. What I do with this firm is I'm helping them through, at this point, the initial stages of getting products into the marketplace in the United States. Their product is in Sweden, it's starting to go around Europe, the rules for market entry and regulation are different in Europe than they are in the U.S., and um, I spend some of my time as a, in my business working with firms that are interesting to me to help them get their products properly understood in the U.S. marketplace. So that's what we're doing now. It's a very clever concept. And it really does save about 75-80% of the water of a typical shower um, and pretty close to that in energy. Uh, Mary? Hmm. I went on mute there. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say people can Google, again, orbital systems in the shower of the future to find a full video on that as well. Uh, but I know this all is possible because of the synergies. And Gary, if you could briefly walk us through that and we'll get into the Q&A. Sure. Um, imagine a water efficient toilet, imagine um, a com an LED light bulb. Which saves water, which saves energy? And the answer is yes, they both do. Um, we have to look at all of these things to figure out what the synergies are. There's lots of them and there's more every time we look. The one that interests me the most turns out to be improving price signals. And I personally think that there's a problem between when we receive the signals related to our energy and water use and when we can act on that information. Um, most of us get bills after the fact. Some of us get water bills as much as six months apart 
Energy bills typically are every month, unless it's oil, which might be once or twice a year. Um, and so it's really hard to adjust behavior when the price signal is out of whack with the use signal. And we need to get those into alignment in order to have better consumer behavior. So uh, we can discuss that in Q&A if people are interested. Yeah, that, that is fascinating. I think um, with the meter use that is uh, improving substantially and it's actually changing the needs in the marketplace for people who have questions about water now that it's being shown to them once a month in many places. So the unintended consequences, though, that can arise, um, I know are a key concern for you that you address as well. Yes. So imagine that water efficiency folks get their way and next Monday morning we wake up and water consumption is 50% of what it is today. What will happen that we didn't think about if that is true? And in the simplest of terms, um, cutting consumption in half means it will take twice as long for the water to get to your building from the water treatment facility. It will also take about twice as long for it to get back to the wastewater treatment facility. The volumes of water will be different, therefore the concentrations of solids in the wastewater treatment will be different. The dosing on the supply side will be off by its days of retention time in the water. Oh, by the way, you'll get similar issues inside the building on both supply and return. And so I think as we move forward, we need to recognize that it is unlikely that um, Water, water efficiency will go away, that consumption of, uh, of water per gallon, gallon per minute, or in terms of flush volumes for toilets and urinals is unlikely to go up over the next 50 years. It is most likely to stay level or go down. And if that's the case in our modern urban environment, we need to plan for a 50 to 100 year horizon for the infrastructure because that's how long what we're going to put in place this year is likely to last before it's going to get any major renovation or repair or replacement. So I think we need to rethink the way we build our infrastructure to be much more attuned to these unintended consequences and mitigate the issue. One of the issues that comes up really frequently now is Legionella um, and it has, it's a, in my opinion, it's the poster child for pathogens in our water systems. But what it appears to be happening is that as we lower velocity, we increase the likelihood of things growing in our piping and easier for them to grow because the water isn't scouring the sidewalls of the pipe as much. And so we're creating, by virtue of a set of rules that we haven't looked at systemically in almost 70 years, um, we're creating a problem of our own making that if we rethought it just a little bit, we could probably fix without too much trouble or at least slow down the rate of growth of the problem. Yeah, and I think, um, Gary, that's a great transition into our Q&A period uh, for people because you have said it's our job to provide the infrastructure that supports those efficient behaviors. And uh, you both seem um, just innately aware of the fact that we can't change people as much as we can change our engineering and designs. So thank you for that. I think we already have a question. Uh, Maria, if you could shoot with yours. Sure. I was just wondering if uh, this was addressed in, in your uh, manufacture there. One of the ways that we race, we all waste water is by running the water to bring temperature up before we step into the shower, right? So how do we not lose that water or by reca or recapturing it? Or even better, how do we come up with, you know, turning on the tap and having hot water? Is that part of the program? Yeah, it is. So I like to ask people a question. What if you could deliver hot water to every fixture in any building wasting no more than one cup after you turn on the tap? Would that be pretty good? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we designed that into Robert's house, and it's one of the m more important areas of my personal technical interest is to figure out better hot water distribution systems. Um, 
it turns out there are only five ways to solve that problem that we've ever found. If someone has a sixth, I'm absolutely interested, and I'll name it for you if you wish. Um, so if we're trying to waste very little while we wait, um, and by the way, one cup may not be the right answer, but I think it's the right way to think about the answer. It's a volume problem. How long are you willing to wait? How much water will run down the drain? What are the flow rates to make that true? And so we did take that into account in our design criteria for Robert's house and for all the house, houses that I work on. Um, the process is fairly straightforward. Once you determine how long you're willing to wait, we actually work backwards and design the plumbing to make that the case. One area that we're working on now is to enable the plumbing code rules to change such that they allow the use of smaller than current uh, diameter piping. Most plumbing codes don't allow less than half inch diameter piping unless an engineer's stamp is involved and even then they make your life a little difficult if you want to use 3 8 piping. But if you're picking uh, public lavatory faucets in, in public buildings, the flow rate on those is only a half a gallon per minute and the physics says for each side of the system which is about a quarter of a gallon per minute that we could actually use I don't know 10 to 20 feet of quarter inch tubing between the source of hot water and the fixtures because that's all you need in order to enable that much flow and there's at least one jurisdiction in the country that requires three quarter inch pipe to the faucet so we're off by a few order at least an order of magnitude in pipe sizing design and we need to fix it yeah, I, um, I know there's some people on the phones who don't have web access, so you can't use the chat. Um, if you have a question right now, we're just going to wait a minute, and you can just chime in with, uh, with your comments or question. Hi, hi this is Yogesh. Can you hear me? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, uh, I had a question. So you mentioned earlier about um, shifting consumer behavior. Um, what, uh, I work in that space. I'm, I'm just a bit curious to understand, um, you know, uh, we, we have a sense of what the current behavior is, but what is the future state behavior you want to get to? And what do you think are the, the trigger points that could lead to that shift if you know that? If, and if you don't, what is the process for you to figure that out? All very good questions. So I'm going to share a story with you to get to the answer. Um, I used to live in Africa. As Mary mentioned, I spent several years there. And while I lived in Africa, I lived in southern Africa during the years of apartheid. And I would observe that during apartheid it was considered by many to be politically correct to steal from government. Okay, so there were lots of you know midnight or 2 a.m. electrical connections to the grid uh, done by your friends who worked for the electric company and you just got connected and if you looked at the peri-urban areas um, around uh, Johannesburg or any of the other um, major cities you'd see these what what looks like a um, cascade of wires, a tent of wires coming off of a power pole down to every one of these tiny little buildings. Well, apartheid ends, and now we've got all these connections, and no one has a street address, so it's really hard to send a bill. And, well, even if you sent a bill, it's not clear who would get it or where it would go because it's all that very confusing. And by the way, it's politically incorrect to steal from yourself because now you're government. So what did they decide to do? They, everyone, rich or poor, received a prepaid electric meter. You go to the local 7-Eleven um, equivalent, you buy a card, you type the punch the number into the, into the, the keypad on the, on the meter, and you buy yourself a day's, a month's, a year's worth of electricity. Well, they've done the same thing more recently for water systems. And so I guess that the problem I face, and the reason I like the idea of prepaying, is that the price signal happens before you use it, and you learn how far it takes you. 
I ask everybody, how much is water at your home right now? How about electricity or natural gas, wastewater treatment, oil, coal, or propane? Nobody actually knows those very well, even though we're in the industry. But everybody knows the price of gasoline or diesel because they buy it regularly. The price is marked all over town. You see it on a regular basis. And I would observe that the price signal is in the right order. It happens before you use it and you learn how far it takes you. And I think if we want people's behaviors to change with resource use, we need to create that relationship to the resource we're trying to impact. I'm not trying to have them do anything in specific. Um, that's not what I'm after. I'm after them getting a signal that allows them to take action on it before it's too late for the bill. Yeah. Um, that's I, I, I'd just like to add one more thing, if I could, Mary. <clears throat> uh, this is Robert, and um, my sort of day job, if you will, has always been management consulting. And, um, you know, the decisions we make uh, on a macro scale and a micro scale are so important, and, and it's essentially how we're judged in terms of leadership and strategy work uh, that we do. And what we've all come to realize is that we're inherently incredibly bad at decision making and and we you know the collective we have to get better at that there's a number of books that have come forward uh, recently uh, to to address that issue to talk about how it is that we make decisions and, and help us make decisions better uh, there's a book by um, Daniel Kahneman called fast and uh, thinking fast and slow another one called nudge by Richard Thaler and a third one called switch by the Heath brothers that all talk about this inherent um, uh, disassociation with our behavior versus what we intend versus what we actually you know end up doing and a small example of it is uh, you know just one that comes to mind is is a study that they did where they tried to assess people's happiness you know and so they always do these studies starting on, on college campuses and they asked students, you know, how happy are you, right, one to five. And they went around and they got a, you know, a scale for these things. And, um, and they then went to the next level of questioning. And uh, instead of just asking them, how happy are you, they first asked them, uh, when's the last time you had a date, right? That's the first question. <laughs> and then the second question was, how happy are you, right? And as you can imagine, the, 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 level of happiness changed significantly as a result of what what the precursor was to the the second question and and in that way we're just not well designed to make great choices uh, and so I think we have to become more discerning consumers and really include and understand for example the externalities uh, of using water and energy we don't immediately pair uh, those things with causing heart disease, lung disease, and cancer, but that's in fact what is happening uh, when we don't pay attention to those things. The the overall unintended consequences are so large, and and everybody talks about, and we spend billions of dollars on curing cancer, right? Uh, but in our grasp is actually preventing cancer, uh, which people don't just don't talk about much, uh, but we deliver toxicity into our environment. Uh, at a level that's frightening, and but we don't connect it back to you know what we do on a daily basis in terms of bringing gas into our house, combusting it, and then breathing it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you know, so in terms of you know heart disease, lung disease, cancer, asthma, so forth. Uh, if you added up the you know external costs that are not actually in the price of the product, uh, you end up with an illogical system uh, of how we make decisions about those things. So I hope that's helpful to answer the question. Yeah, very helpful. And uh, we have just a few more minutes for questions here. So I'll pause in just uh, right after the answer to the next one, which is on this impossible house, which you were told, Robert, was impossible by the people who said, I wanted to produce it efficient. You went to them and said, I want it to be efficient and I don't want to pay a whole lot more. And they said, no, it's going to be more. But you have provided now a model that's cheaper, also more efficient, more sustainable, and everyone can make decisions more easily simply by following the model that you and Gary have created. 
how long did it take for you to do that? And what would you say are the critical success factors for a pilot if someone's going to undertake something similar? Yeah, great question, Mary. Um, and I, I want Gary to ch chime in as well. You know, my, my thought process around this was really simple in its essence. And, and I actually wanted, you know, we hired the best, greenest architects we could find. And they, you know, wanted to do what they've always done. And you can hear this in the, in the TEDx, um, you know, very clearly. It's, it's not that they're bad people or, you know, they wanted to be malicious. Uh, it's just, you know, we end up with a system that actually doesn't work because we're so siloed in how we think about these things. The electricians don't talk to the plumbers. The, you know, the, the architect doesn't really uh, understand that he's building the last five buildings that he's built uh, and primarily on, on other considerations uh, versus what we're talking about today. Uh, you know, it's, it's aesthetics, it's uh, building code. In, and as we all know, the building code is the least, uh, you know, least effective building that you could possibly get through the planning department. That, that's what the building code is, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we, we kind of miss that sometimes thinking, well, if we've done better than the code, well, aren't we great? But it's, you know, it's, uh, there's so much more that could be done and should be done. Um, the total process, uh, you know, took too long, uh, effectively, because I, I'm not a builder, uh, but I had to put my boots on uh, to actually construct the thing. And I'm not a designer, but I ended up, you know, on Google SketchUp uh, designing the thing. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons. And we wanted to not just build a building, but build the movement behind this thing and build a community around this thing that understood that this is all possible. Uh, so it took longer than it would, you know, to copy it for sure. Uh, but the um, the process probably took four years in uh, total uh, and a year and a month in construction. And we've um, we finished in uh, I'm sorry uh, April of 2012. So the building's been in operation for uh, almost four and a half years and delivered consistently on the promise. Uh, to, to you know, over deliver on energy, make it less expensive, and we we're using a third less water as well in in the process. Gary, so, what are your other thoughts about that? I think that um, Robert, the thing that struck me in the in the conversations we had on the project was how uh, difficult it was to integrate all of the various best things since sliced bread, if you will, into a sandwich that tasted good, called your home. <laughs> um, and I think that, that that's, for anyone who's contemplating uh, a project of this nature, um, that that's the biggest challenge. Everybody and their cousin has a product that they think is absolutely superb, and it might very well be true. Um, and I have a rule for products. They must do what they claim to do. Um, if they don't, I'm really not interested in them. Then our job as integrators is to take those products and make sure that the system works as we intend it to work. Um, and that turns out to be the biggest challenge, in my opinion, for pro projects of this sort. Um, Robert spent an enormous amount of time picking materials that not only worked well together when installed, but could be deconstructed in 50 to 100 years when it when and if it became necessary to do so and get recycled properly. Well, not everybody thinks that way. Once you've figured out those basic strategies and you've gotten them to work, um, I would stay stuck on replicating the, the, the business model, if you will, the duplicatable model of what works. Do that a lot until you get good at it and then decide whether or not you're going to add in new products and make other changes. Um, so I, th those are the things that I think one can learn from what, what Robert's done so far um, and apply to future projects. Right, and the greenideahouse.com is where people can find that information. Uh, he mentioned as simple um, access to um, both Gary's efforts, Gary Klein and Associates, and uh, the greenideahouse.com. Um, on the web, we hope you will uh, friend them also on LinkedIn and also join our LinkedIn group, which is uh, um, uh, available in the email reminder that you got, or you can email me at info at globalwaterworks.org. And this is Mary Eggert with Global Waterworks. And I have just one final question for Gary. Um, 
the timeline for the the shower of the future i know it's in europe when will it be here when can i buy it for i'm thinking of all my friends in I'm, california who don't have water i'm sure they'd be happy to sell you one now the question is whether your local code official will let you install it um, and we're in the process of getting that uh, approved those approvals now the product is into iatmo for testing there's a stand, product standard that's applicable to this and they're working their way through that process. I guess I'd say later this year or very early next. Um, you know, don't hold your breath, but sometime between uh, November and January is when I would expect it to become available in the U.S. Perfect. We're uh, just thrilled to have both of you uh, with us today, Gary and Robert, and all of our guests. And I know many of you on the line have worked in water for years and have ideas to add as well. So I'm hoping that you might chime in on our LinkedIn group, or as I said, drop us an email on topics or solutions that you've seen that are really working uh, to make uh, to find water savings as well as energy savings and to make our world a better place. Um, we thank you and hope you have a great day. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, thank you, guys. You take care, and I will put a recording up on our YouTube channel as well here very shortly. So you can find us at uh, um, Global Waterworks on YouTube, and uh, look forward to you chiming in there, subscribing, so you get all future webinars as well. Um, have a great day. Cool. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.